At Cape Kennedy, the familiar shape on the launch pad, a symbol of the space age. The familiar countdown, the signal for a beginning. But the real beginnings of this mission, any mission, go back in time. A time when only the dreamers, the visionaries, could guess at what lay ahead. By official reckoning, the beginning was in 1958. The first small steps, legislation, a new agency, a table of organization, and a determination to make it all work in a way never dreamed of before. The program did work. It is working. In less than two decades, an orbiting laboratory circled the Earth, its crew conducting scientific research and performing experiments, testing the limits of human endurance for long periods in space, duplicating scenes science fiction writers described years earlier. In less than two decades, the space program has reached a level of precision of almost flawless routine performance. But such routines rarely generate the excitement, the glamour of previous years. Previous years when a small, single satellite could command giant double headlines, holding out the promise of dazzling achievements. The early dreamers and visionaries started the momentum. Two brothers from Dayton soaring above a lonely beach in powered flight. A professor from Massachusetts firing off a rocket. They started the excitement, and it was a long time subsiding. Behind the headlines, the accomplishments, there was something else. Consider the thoughts of a modern-day visionary, Isaac Asimov, scientist, writer, eclectic watcher of space progress. In any consideration of the space program, it's best not to look upon it as a succession of spectaculars, I think, or to think of it as a kind of baseball game in which that side wins who hits the most home runs. We're doing something in space that's more important than the personalities involved or the individual feats. It's also to be remembered that the astronauts themselves represent the visible peak of a large pyramid, most of which, as far as the general public was concerned, was quite invisible. There are many things that had to happen, had to be in existence, in order for those astronauts to move out into space to safely reach the moon and safely come back. And there are faithful human beings tending those instruments, making those plans, designing the vessels, taking care of a hundred thousand small details that all the rest of us completely miss. If we concentrate on the astronauts themselves 
it would seem that here we have a group of the very finest kind of Americans in a rather old-fashioned tradition. Uh, great family men, clean-cut adventurers, almost as though it were McGuffey's readers come to life. Uh, and yet, behind the lines, there are people, I am sure, from every kind of background, from the big cities, indeed from the big city slums, perhaps, uh, to farms, from mountainous regions, from the plains. It is, it is the product of a cross-section of America with a large representation, naturally, <laughs> of what we might call the educated groups, the engineers and the scientists, and in addition, I rather suppose, a great many foreign-born people, too. In the last analysis... And so they came, the people and the machines, marshaled and scheduled by a unique partnership of government, industry, and education. It was done because there was focus, a goal. Land a man on the moon by 1970. The goal was reached with six months to spare. Now the accomplishments of Apollo blend into a composite picture of success. And still our attention is riveted to the symbol, the launch. In December 1972, when Apollo 17 took off, the last of the launches that were then planned, I watched the launching at night. Uh, it was just past midnight, as a matter of fact. And I have never seen anything that was so awe-inspiring, really. It was at night, and suddenly the flames shot up, and the whole earth lit up in a kind of pseudo-semi-daylight. The sky became a kind of tan. It was an orange light, not real daylight. But the whole world lit up in this weird light, and I had to wait a few moments before it took off. And naturally, that was a frightening thing, because simply because I was watching it. Would anything go wrong? But it didn't. It took off and began to climb higher and higher and higher, and the light continued all over. We could see in every direction until finally it diminished and diminished and diminished, and the night gradually came back, and the stars gradually returned to the sky, and the sea gradually grew black. Nothing sudden, little by little until finally Apollo 17 was just a bright star in the sky, moving, moving, growing dimmer, growing dimmer, 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 until one couldn't be sure which star it was, and all the rest was black.
And you know, it's a funny thing. No science fiction writer, as far as I knew, ever dreamed that the first step on the moon would be visible on television, back on Earth. We always had the notion that they would reach the moon and that man would know about it only when they came back and told them about it. So, you know, there are limits to the, our ability to predict. And in general, where we're not being completely fantastic, we are hopelessly conservative. With all the success and acclamation, there still are doubts and questions. You will frequently hear people ask, but what do we get out of it all? What's the good of going to the moon? So what if they get some rocks back from the moon? And again, this is a case of trying to judge the whole by the little tip of the iceberg. There are a great many things going on behind uh, that which is most clearly visible. There are all kinds of te technological advances in computer technology, in, in, in communications, uh, in engineering of all kinds, all of which can then be applied in other directions as well. There is nothing that will bear the label made through space technology in some of the in some of the less tangible advances. The fact that we can learn how to predict weather better is largely due to our weather satellites. But people forget that. They can watch uh, Olympics in Japan without constantly thinking, this is made possible to me for a, by a communication satellite. In fact, what is, in a sense, most wonderful, at the same time most frustrating, is that no one can tell what the most important aspect of an increase of knowledge may be for decades, perhaps centuries.